Our scripture passage for this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 14 to 19. And I'll be reading from the NIV translation. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. And Jesus said, again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you so much for your word. Your word who is Jesus the Christ. Your word who is the Holy Spirit who is with us on this wonderful, beautiful Mother's Day morning. Lord, we thank you so much for your word that is the sharing of the faith. Especially, Lord, for all of those mothers who have shared the faith with us. And God, we thank you so much for your word that is the Holy Scriptures that we have read before us. We ask the Lord that as we listen now and as we speak now, that it may all come from your word. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. 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 Let's turn the microphone on. Hey, at work. We're going to try this microphone out right now. Uh, I feel like I got a call to, to, to start the sermon off a little differently than what I planned. If you have your hymnals still handy, uh, go back to the hymns that we've sung so far. Uh, one of you spoke to me this morning, not going to say who, and you said, you know, I've really been praying lately uh, for God to help me to keep the faith. That's such an important part of Christian life. Is anybody in here a sports fan? Anybody a sports fan? I'm a really big fan of basketball, and it's basketball playoffs right now. NBA playoffs has been really exciting. And, uh, and there was this really good basketball player one time who went, fan who, who went viral. It's when, like, us video plays over and over again and millions of people watching stuff like that. And this is what he went, this is what he went viral for. He was talking to a reporter, and the reporter said, Mr. Iverson, Alan Iverson, uh, people are complaining about uh, you're, you're not really giving it your all in practice. And his response was, practice? Practice? We didn't even talk about the game. talking about how I practice. But truly, how you practice is how you play. Why would anybody, in fact, Practice anything. Here, here, here's, a, here's a good example. Uh, do we have freedom? Are we free to do anything we want? Would you agree with that? I, th I think so. I am free right now to go over there and play the piano. What I'm not free to do, I am not free to go and play that piano as beautifully as Marion did during that offering of mine. I don't practice the piano. I can't play the piano that beautifully, that well. The more we practice our faith, the more beautiful our faith will be. The more we practice our faith, the stronger our faith will be when the strong winds of life beat against us. So I want to point out just a couple of lines. From our first hymn that we sang this morning, He Lives. What a great hymn. Verse 2 starts off with this. In all the world around me, I see His loving care. Boy, ain't that like a mother on Mother's Day? God's loving care. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. Lord, increase our faith that we may rightly sing that, so that even though times get hard, we still do not despair. 
He continues, I know that he is leading. That's why we do not despair, because we trust that Jesus is leading through all the stormy blasts, and the day of his appearing will come at last. I tell people, you can't ruin movies for me. You can't ruin a story for me. You can't ruin a book for me. You know why? Because I know how the world's going to end. And it's going to end with Jesus coming back. There is no such thing as a spoiler alert, because we as Christians know that Jesus is leading. Go to our second hymn today. He leadeth me, O blessed thought. Verse, verse stanza, not verse. Stanza three. I used to say verse three. And I had a minister of music who's like, hey, it's stanzas, not verses. So stanza three. Lord, I would place my hand in thine. Nor ever murmur, nor repine. Content whatever lot I see. Oh, would we have such faith that we would be content with whatever is in our hand, whatever we have? Content, I lost my spot, content with whatever lot that I see, since tis thy hand, O God, that leadeth me. God leads us. I, I just had to start the sermon off with that, um, and, and God's going to make it all come together somehow, I know, but God was leading me to start off with that. Um, really what I was planning on starting off with was talking about what normal is. Um, and, and I don't know about you all, I'm, I'm a big movie fan, and uh, in DC, the, the Marvel, not the Marvel rival DC, they've got this, this character, I don't know if she's a hero, I think she's the Joker's girlfriend or something like that. I don't, I'm not a, a crazy fan, I don't, I don't nerd out on this kind of stuff. But her name's Harley Quinn, and one of her famous lines is, normal, does anybody want to know what normal is? Normal is a setting on the washing machine. That's what normal is. I love that. There's nothing in life that's truly normal. But if we want to talk about normal, if we just want to get to the basics of what's a good definition for normal, take this home with you and store it in your mind. This is what normal is. It's just your daily habits. What habits do you have daily? What do you do normally in the morning? Well, I get up, I go brush my teeth, I go and have a cup of coffee. I make sure I spend some time in prayer to the Lord and read scripture. What's your normal? What's your, what's your habits? Here we are, 2022, coming out on Mother's Day of, of, the, of the great pandemic of 2020 that lasted two years. <laughs> are we trying to get back to normal? That's all we want. We just want to get back to normal. But listen, as Christians, our normal should always be changing because our normal is pretty sinful we're sinful people and, and, and we want what we want and if we really just incline our ways to our norms well we'll end up like Sodom and Gomorrah or or Nineveh someone who is just completely engulfed in ourselves but if we actually respond to the gospel, we will find that our life should be anything but normal. We should realize there's, there's no going back to normal. Now, when Jesus came and called the disciples originally, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, and, and other disciples, but those four in particular, those four were fishermen. And when Jesus found them originally, what did he say? Come follow me, and I will make you fish for men. I will make you fish for men. Now, they followed Jesus for three years. And one night, Jesus sat down and he washed their feet. And then he gave them bread and said, this is my body given for you. And he gave them a cup and said, this is my cup given for you. And he looked at them and he said, hey, one of you are going to betray me. And Peter, the leader of the group, the one whose name was Simon, and Jesus changed his name to Peter. Peter said, Lord, even though everyone else might abandon you, I'm not going to abandon you. Even if my fellow fishermen, my fellow kind of inner circle, me, James, and John, even if James and John abandon you, Jesus, I'm not going to abandon you. Even if my little brother Andrew runs away scared because the Romans are coming after you, I'm going to be right beside you, Jesus. If you die, I'm going to die too. You guys know what Jesus said. I assure you that before the cock crows three times in the morning, you will deny me three times. That's exactly what happened. In fact, Peter denied Jesus so much that the Greek there is a little bit ambiguous. He cursed, and it could have been that he was cursing Jesus. 
You see, they were accusing him. Certainly, you know this Jesus. You're a Galilean. Your accent gives you away. You certainly know this Jesus. And in order to separate yourself from someone else, you might degrade that person to say, listen, I wouldn't associate with such filth. Peter might have said, I don't know that, that, that poor person, that dirt bag. I don't know that person. He could have cursed Jesus. That's how far away he fell. If you look at your scripture today, you might find it says, uh, well, mine actually says Jesus and Peter. I like that one a lot. Uh, my NIV study Bible that I was looking at said Jesus restores Peter. I'm not really a fan of that. That title for the scripture, Jesus Restoring Peter. Because as Peter denied Jesus three times, here Jesus, is he restoring Peter three times? Is, is, is that what's going on? I think if we study, study the scripture, I don't think that's what we find. I think rather what we find is Jesus reminds Peter of his grace and his love. I think he reminds Peter that in fact he is sent out. Still, even though he failed, even though he still fails, I think he reminds Peter that he is sent out. Now, if you would, let me give a plug, but not a, not a short little plug. I want to take some time on this plug, and I want to talk to mothers. I'm sorry, guys, this is not your day, okay? This is Mother's Day, all right? And, and I'm not just talking about mothers who have children of their own. I'm talking about any mama who loves on anybody, any woman who just shares God's love. I want to talk with you for a moment. I want you to know this. God loves you exactly as you are. He accepts you exactly where you are. And he wants you exactly as you are. He wants to send you forth to be a mama to others in this world exactly as you are. And this is how I know this. Because over and over again, we have, we have, we have examples throughout history of women who love on children. Their own children or not their own children. Because God loves them. First example I want to give is it's probably the most hands-on mama I've ever heard of. It's not my mama. <laughs> Her name is Susanna Wesley. <coughs> Susanna Wesley is the, the mother of Methodism. John and Charles Wesley started Methodism, and they had a mama who was so hands-on in their faith, they had no option but to become Anglican priests. That was their only choice. <laughs> Susanna Wesley was such a hands-on mama that every single week, she would devote an hour a, 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 a week, every single week, she would devote one single hour just to that kid, to each and every single one of her kids. And you might think, well, that's pretty nice. You know, I've got two children. I could probably do an hour a week just one-on-one -on -one with them. No, she had 19 children, <laughs> and she devoted one hour every single week. John Wesley, by the all right, it's 3 o'clock on Tuesday afternoon. Come on, me and you. you got to talk to Mama for an hour. Even if you didn't want to, you had to talk to Mama for an hour. And then moms, if you feel like, man, I didn't, I didn't do that, or that, that's, that's a lot, know this, she also practiced self-care. Susanna Wesley, it was told, would often take an hour a day, not a week, an hour a day in solitude by herself. And if she couldn't find a solitude, she couldn't find a place in her room, she would take her dress and fold it over her head just to hide herself from her family. Like, I need my time to be the Lord here for a moment. But she was all in on her kids' lives, and she raised her kids. And, and, of course, her husband Samuel, who was also an Anglican priest, he was there and involved in their lives, but often he was gone because he had to go to London a lot of times. And that meant that she was along with her kids a lot. And not just her kids, but the other kids in the community. And you know what she did? Because her husband was the priest of the parish, she stood up when he left and got people around her house to read the Bible again. To pray together. Now this was unheard of at this time. A woman in the Anglican church can't be leading small groups. And yet she was doing it. Her reasoning was, there's no one else around here that's, that can read. I can read. There's no one else around here that's going to be able to get everybody into their house. I can do that. So she made that happen. She kind of created small groups uh, there in that parish. It was really awesome. Very hands-on mama. Now, that's really awesome, and we kind of need moms like that, but not all moms are like that. There was another mom who, uh, imagine this or not, can you imagine as a mom taking your, your, your three-month to four-month-old baby and putting them in the river and just hoping that someone will pick them up? 
Can you imagine that as a mom? That is exactly what Jochebed did. You guys all know who Jochebed is, right? I think you might be able to guess who Jochebed is. Who's Jochebed? Moses' mother, that's right. Jochebed, in a time in Egypt in which the, the Israelites were slaves, and the Israelites couldn't really have uh, male children, she looked at Moses' face and she said, man, I love this baby so much, there's no way I'm going to let them find out about it. So she tried to hide it. And about three or four months in, she realized, I can't hide this baby anymore. So she made a little boat, put some tar on it, to make sure it would float. And, and I think she really timed this out to when she knew that Pharaoh's daughter would be there. And she laid him in the river, and he floated down the river. Pharaoh's daughter found him, and she, she just thought, what a beautiful baby boy. And it just so happened that Moses' older sister, Miriam, was just kind of watching. She just happened to be there, right? Just happened. And she went to Pharaoh's, da to Pharaoh's daughter, and she said, hey, you want me to go find some Israelite woman to nurse him? And who did she find? His own mom, Jochebed. And so she nursed him until the weaning process was done, which is about three or four years old. And then at three or four years old, Moses went to be Pharaoh's daughter's son. So she didn't raise her own son from four or five years old on. Would you call Jochebed a bad mom? No. She did absolutely the best she could at the time. And she's not alone. Hannah, the mother of Samuel, the first prophet, Samuel uh, anointed Saul and David as king, and Hannah prayed for her son. She couldn't get a kid at all. She was praying. In fact, she was praying so fervently in the church that Eli, the priest, looked at her and he said, Are you drunk? What are you mumbling about? And she said, I'm not drunk. I just want so deeply to have a kid of my own. And even if I did have him, I would give him to God. I promise I will. And she had Samuel. And wouldn't you know it? Just like Jochebed. After the weaning process was done, she took him to the temple. And she left him there. Would we say that Hannah was an awful mom? No, absolutely not. In fact, maybe she did better than any of us could do. She just said, God, he's yours. Take him. And so many times, moms and dads are guilty of this too. We say, Lord, I can't deal with this child. Take him. All right, Jesus, give me back to him. He's fine. You know? <laughs> it's so hard for us just to leave people to God. Especially our very own children. And yet she did that. And then we have mothers who perhaps don't even have children of their own. I, I, I have people in my life who are not my biological mom that I call mama. I have Mama Val, my best friend's mom. Her name's Valerie Vera. I call her Mama Val because even though she's not my mom, she's like a mother to me. You guys have people like this in your life, right? Mama Jane, not my mom, like a mother to me, right? These are, these are still mothers. In Joppa, in, in Acts chapter 9, we find out there's a city called Joppa, this town called Joppa. Joppa, there was a woman whose name was Tabitha. And, and the scripture doesn't tell us, does not tell us she had any children, but what it does tell us is that she certainly acted like a mama to the people in this town. Now, in Joppa, Tabitha would actually care for all the people. She would make them clothes. Any, any mamas sew anything for their kids? Any of you sew anything for somebody else's kids? She would actually make them blankets. She would make them prayer shawls. Well, in Acts chapter 9, we find the story of how Tabitha got sick and died. And in a nearby town, Peter was there. And so the disciples sent for Peter, and they said, Peter, can you come and see what you can do? So Peter got there. When he got there, everyone was telling him about how she took care of them. They showed him the blankets she made for her. They showed him the dresses that she had made for them. They said, Peter, this woman, even though she wasn't our mama, she loved us like our mama. She was amazing. So Peter sent everybody out of the room, and he knelt down by the bed, and he prayed stood up and he took her by the hand and he said, Tabitha, get up. And what do you know? She got up and he led her by the hand out the room for everyone to see that she was alive. Anybody have times in their life in which you just feel like life is hitting you hard and all you want is a hug from mama? All you want is that warm embrace from your mom. Maybe your mom is has gone on to heaven and, and you don't have that opportunity anymore. And if your mom has gone on to heaven and you can't get that warm embrace from your mom again, man, what do you want? 
That was the disciples of Joppa when Tabitha had died. Man, I just want a warm embrace from mom one more time. And thanks be to God, we were able to get that. Maybe we're not able to get that, but what we can get, what we can get is a warm embrace from another mom. What we can get is a warm embrace from our own brothers and sisters. Maybe our aunt, maybe our grandma, maybe our daughter, or someone else's daughter. <laughs> what we can get is love from others. The last mom I want to talk about is Mary. Yes, Mary, the mother of Jesus. And this is the mom that I hope that we would all, men included, seek to emulate most. And I just want to point out one thing from Mary's story. When the angel Gabriel said to her that she was going to bear Jesus, what did she say? I am the servant of the Lord. May it be as you have said. When God sends messengers into our life with good or bad messages, messages that we want to be a part of or messages we don't want to be a part of, messages that may tear apart the engagement that we're currently in, which was the situation Mary found herself in, or messages that will take us to new life that we're so excited about. Whether we are excited about the message or not, when God sends messengers into our lives, may we try our best to be like Mother Mary, the mother of Jesus, and say, I'm a servant of the Lord. May it be, Lord Jesus, as you have said. Now, I want to use all of these examples of women, mothers who, like Mary, were there when their children died. She was there when Jesus was crucified. Mothers who uh, gave their children up at the age of three or four years old, something we can't even imagine in our culture. Mothers who just love their children like crazy, like Susanna Wesley and, and her children buried her. I want to point out, life is great. You do the best you can, no matter where you are, exactly as you are. And you want to know how I know God accepts that? Because Jesus accepts Peter right here. In this scripture, Jesus reminds Peter that he is loved exactly where he's at. You see, this word love is, is the whole point of this, script, of, of, of this little piece of scripture right here. And it's not love like it just encompasses everything like we think about it. See, there's three Greek words for love. There's euros, which is not used, so we're not even going to talk about that. There's agape, which is like God's amazing, unconditional, love you with my whole heart, lay down my life for you type love. And then there's phileo love, the uh, brotherly love. It's where we get the word Philadelphia, city of brotherly love, phileo love. I love you like family. And each time Jesus asks this question to Peter, the first two times he uses the same word, and then he uses the second one. So the first time Jesus says, Peter, do you love me more than these? And the reason he says more than these is because earlier when Peter told them they were going to run, when Jesus told the disciples they were going to abandon him, Peter said, not I, I love you more than everybody else, Jesus. And so Jesus said, do you really love me more than these? Do you think you love me more than other people love me? Obviously, you, you fail, Peter. But the word that he uses there is agape. Peter, do you love me unconditionally more than these do? Peter, do you love me with your whole heart more than the other disciples? What does Peter say back? Yes, Lord, I love you. But the word he uses is not agape. The word he uses is phileo. Yes, Lord, I phileo you. I love you like a brother. So then the second time Jesus says, well, never mind everybody else, Peter. Just you and me here. Just a personal relationship between you and me here. Do you love me with your whole heart? Do you agape me, Peter? Peter replies, yes, Lord, I belay on you. It would be like two people in a budding relationship, and one of them finally is at that point that they're going to say, I love you. And that person replies, I like you a lot kind of stings a little bit. Jesus wants Peter to say, I love you with my whole heart. And all Peter can say is, I love you like a brother. Champ punches him in the arm or something. That's all he can say. You ever struggle with your faith? Anybody ever, ever just say, Jesus, where are you at in this? God, I'm trying. I'm trying to follow you, but I, I don't know that I can. Maybe that's why we need to practice that faith. Maybe that's where it's coming in at again. 
You ever struggle with your faith in life? Find comfort in this. Peter was looking Jesus in the eye, and he couldn't tell him that he loved him with his whole heart. So John tells us in this scripture, Jesus says again, Peter, do you love me? And he says, Peter is hurt. John points this out. He says, Peter is hurt because the third time Jesus said, do you love me? But this time, this is why he's hurt. The third time Jesus doesn't say, do you agape me? Do you love me with your whole heart? The third time Jesus said, do you phileo me? So Jesus' standards for Peter were here. Do you love me unconditionally, wholeheartedly? Will you lay down your life for me? And after Peter, Jesus realized Peter's right here, Jesus said, it's okay. Wherever you are, I'm going to come meet you at. It's okay if you don't have faith the size of a mountain. It's okay if you don't have faith the size of a mustard seed. It's okay if your faith is only the size of a little tiny electron particle. It's okay. Jesus still loves you. Peter was hurt because Jesus said, do you phileo me rather than do you agape me? Peter still replies, Lord, you know everything. You know that I phileo you. Know this, whether we can look Jesus in the eye and say, I love you no matter what, unconditionally, wholeheartedly. Or we're like Peter and all we can say is, I love you like a brother, champ. Or whether we have the faith the size of a mountain, a mustard seed, or a little tiny electron, no matter where we are in our relationship, our walk with Jesus, he still says these words to us. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. He still sends us. He still, at the end of this conversation with Peter, says, follow me. He still sends us forward. Now, Peter, just this morning, the scripture here says this is the third time uh, that, that Jesus appeared to him. He found them fishing. When Jesus originally told them, follow me, what were they doing? They were fishing. And Jesus said, if you follow me, I will make you fish for people. So they followed Jesus for three years. They watched Jesus die. They watched Jesus rise from the grave. And you know what they're still doing? They're still fishing. They're not fishing for people. Jesus does not want us to go back to the way things were. He does not want us to get back to normal. He wants us, I mean, sure, we've got to fish because we've got to stay alive. We've got to eat something. We've got to do a little bit of work. But he wants us to move on from just fishing for ourselves and start fishing for people. He wants us to move on from just trying to take care of ourselves and feed the flock and take care of the flock. No matter where we are, Jesus still sends us. Whether we think we're the best mom in the world or the worst mom in the world. Whether we're a mom who gave up our child at three years old or maybe a mom who put our kid in a river at three months old. Jesus still loves us and he still wants us to share his love with others in the world. We have new habits to make every single day. Every day our habits, our new normal should in fact lead us to a place in which we take care of God's people and we share God's love with God's people this day and forevermore. So take comfort no matter where you are. Jesus accepts you and he still sends you and I out into the world to be his hands and feet. That, that makes me say thank you, Jesus, and thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God, thank you so much for your love for us. Your love that is abounding, abundant. Your word that is, your love that is, that is unconditional. Your love that is never failing. Your agape love. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would fill us with that love, that we may show that same love to others, because we know, left to our own selves, Lord, the most we can do is phileo you. The most we can do is love you like a brother. The Holy Spirit, change our hearts that we may be able to show your agape love, not only back to you, Jesus, but to this whole world, that we may truly be able to feed your sheep and to take care of your lambs. Jesus, let it start with us in our hearts here. Thank you for accepting us as we are. Empower us to be better than we are now, better than we are yesterday, so that we may always create new normals, a normal of sharing your love more abundant than what we did yesterday. 
In Jesus, we ask and pray this all in your precious name. Amen and amen.